On this episode of The Badge and Beyond, we may be discussing domestic violence, mental health issues, suicide and self-harm. If you would like support and someone to talk to, the right avenues in your local area would be appreciated for you to have a look at those options. Um, please make use of avenues such as Lifeline on 13 11 14. Um, and also for domestic violence hotline 1800 respect so if you are listening discretion is advised welcome back this is part two of our episode on racism in policing uh, in the first episode, which you hopefully just watched or listened to, uh, we were discussing a number of different things, some of Danny's experiences, some of the trying to break open the myths that you know law enforcement in the US and Hollywood has created, um, and dived right into some recent politics, which we didn't originally plan on. Um, in this section, I think we really want to talk a little bit more specifically about the overrepresentation of the Aboriginal community in policing, um, in, in you know uh, whether it be corrections, um, in courts, and their interactions with law enforcement. I have had um, a number of positions where I've been interacting with um, people from the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community on a regular basis. Um, and honestly, it was, it's quite interesting working with those people. Um, first of all, I will say that um, I think I was nearing the end of my career before I first got any cultural diversity training um, really? to understand, yeah, what you know, how the Aboriginal community felt and what their, you know, how they saw and interpreted things. Um, realised in that training, I'd probably been sworn at a few times in, um, in certain dialects. Um, and so I think it's a good thing, that was a good thing that uh, police were getting that training, but it was kind of far too late. And even though we had ACLOs, uh, Aboriginal Community Liaison Officers, um, I didn't really feel like they would, I kind of felt like they were out working with the community, but they never really spoke to the cops, you know. Um, but look, I think part of what I want to achieve here today, and we both do, is to help you, the viewer, the listener, to understand both sides um, and hopefully unpack some of those notions you have about um, how members from that community are, are always treated um, and accept things on an individual basis. Um, I have to say my last command had a large um, Aboriginal community involvement uh, in in that, in that pack, that police area command. And one of the things I remember being down there of a night trying to deal with a, a, an issue that arose and some of the elders came out to me. It was the first time I'd, I'd spoke, even as a senior officer, being introduced to the elders. Um, and I was quite wary. I was like, these guys are going to unload on me. Uh, and you know what? They were so supportive. They were, they were actually apologetic. They were apologetic for what the police were having to deal with at that time. Um, they're like, this is this is not representative of our tribe and our people, um, and we appreciate what you're trying to do. And please, you know, we want to help you and work with you. You know, and that was it was interesting that I had my own perception of how that interaction was going to go without any understanding because I was so used to being um, just abused by anybody from that community. Um, and yeah, that was that was really kind of, um, I won't say heartwarming, but made me feel better about what we were trying to achieve there. Um, so look, dealing as a police officer with, Abor with the Aboriginal population, the Torres Strait Islander population, um, I think policing, New South Wales police has had tumultuous times. I was in the Redfern riots, I got called out to attend that. Um, and look, I've had some horrendous interactions with um, people from that community and I've met some of the nicest people I've ever met from that community. Um, but again, it goes back to what we were talking about before in perceptions. Yeah. So Danny, you were a, you're a custody manager um, as well as I was, you were, you were trained. Um, one of the things I, I think we need to unpack is what are those what are the mitigating things that are put in place 
um, to help a vulnerable person, which includes people of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, um, and they have their own set of rules around custody in a police station. Uh, one of some of the things that the New South Wales Police has in place to help them get through that. Well, they also they offer um, specific cultural informed legal um, mm -hmm. sort of advice. So you have Aboriginal Legal Aid, which is actually a really good unit. Yep. Um, I did a bit of work in the, in the consulting space on juvenile detention uh, in terms of repeat offending in breaching AVOs and uh, bail. And the Ab Aboriginal Legal Service was like, it really comes into its own on on service delivery. Mm -hmm. um, I actually got to really experience more of what they do and they, they do an ex excellent job in the juvenile space. And so if, if a young person's in custody from, an, from that Indigenous um, background and they have the ability to access mm -hmm. um, Aboriginal legal services um, but also they can have someone from their community come out as a support person yes um, and that can be great but also problematic because mm. there are also rules around what, what a support person can be yes and you'll find what we've got to look at the, the complexities of um, not only just being from an indigenous background but also being a juvenile mm -hmm. um, there are complexities around what kind of people you're around um, and what experiences they've had. And so if you, can, if you can't have someone, for example, that's had a criminal record, you may rule out almost the entire support yeah. network. Yep. And if it's three in the morning and you're trying to find people, that's, mm -hmm. that's not easy. Yeah. Um, you know, and that becomes an issue for uh, not just the young person but for the police. Yes. Um, in, in how we're going to process this, this charge and how is it going to move forward. Yep. And, and look, one of the other things I think people don't know is that when you're in custody, uh, as if I turn up in custody, the police have me, can hold me for four hours um, before I'm charged. And that four hours has um, time that's counted in and time that's counted out. Yep. And that can be extended through a court, or up to, a court order up to six hours. But if you're from the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community, that is automatically halved. So you are down to two hours. So, and then again, through court order, it can be extended, but that creates a great amount of pressure on police to try to get things done in a certain period of time. Um, and I think it's important to note that because oftentimes people talk about that members of that community being brought into the police, at least the, we're talking from a New South Wales perspective. If you're listening outside of this, I can't comment on Queensland, Melbourne, etc. But you know, there's this belief that, oh, they come in, they get treated like everybody else, and, and they don't. There are special considerations in place. Like you said, Aboriginal legal service, which we are obliged, even if the person in custody doesn't want to speak to them, we're still obliged to call them, and the police are still obliged to let them know that they're in custody. Um, the time frames are automatic. Uh, the system has it built in, so you get notifications that this person flags as this, and you can only use this, this, and this. Um, so... You know, there are special considerations in play to help those people um, to make sure that there's some kind of equity and equality in, built into the system. Mm. Even who you can place in the cell with, yes. the, with that person as well. Yep, yep. Um, and specifically also trying to mitigate any risk of um, self-harm mm. um, and stress and anxiety, so they have to be kept in different placements at times. So I think that's really important to unpack so people know. Um, I guess one of the other things for me is um, we see an over-representation of the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander community in our prison population. Uh, but from the work I've done in forensic psych and uh, from our own experience, and, and you've done a lot of work in juvenile um, justice as well, um, what I see is that the problem we have with policing that community is that we're being left, we're, the, we're the, like the last line mm. to pick up the pieces and we're an organisation that's created to deal with law enforcement. Mm. Yet, from my experience, the issues stem from the social and community issues way beyond their for anyone's first interaction from that community's yeah. interaction with police. 100%. And even... The even when it, when it comes to community services, as, as in child protection, hmm. um, you know, what, 
even back when, in the, when they were Department of Community Services back in the docks days, there were significant problems. They were always going through royal commissions and things mm. um, because of the Aboriginal, even their own deaths in custody from their perspective, deaths in yeah. care, yeah. Aboriginal deaths in care. Um, and even out-of-home care services for foster parents, trying to find Aboriginal foster carers is really hard. Yes. And it's extremely difficult to have an ch Aboriginal child placed with a non-Aboriginal family, mm. regardless of how fantastic that family could yep. be, which again creates another layer of complexity. And I think we've always found, and this is, this is just um, indicative in a lot of the Western world, we think we have the solution by forcing things to happen with people of the same community. That makes sense. Mm. Like, you could be a very destructive parent, but because you're the same bloodline, then that's fine. Mm -hmm. We'll put you with this child. Yes. Right? And that's, that just doesn't work for anyone. Um, but we're so worried. We've gone so the other way. We're overcompensating on, you know, what issues we've had in our history that we think because we, tr it, again, historically around the world, you know, with colonialism and what happens, we destroy, um, we destroy relations with the indigenous community as mm -hmm. we come in, right? Yep. It's the same old story everywhere, really, that, where that happens. So then there's marginalization, there's all these restrictions, but then what we do, because we think we're progressive and advanced, is we start coming up with all these other strategies later on to overcome that kind of guilt. Mm. And then people that had nothing to do with it Right? Yeah. Absolutely nothing to do with it. Have now a, a part of this little process in trying to redeem what's happened, mm. whether it's reconciliation, whether it's doing your opening address and addressing the traditional owners of the land and the speech. I question, as controversial as that will be, I question the practical support that does to an indigenous community. Mm. And in working alongside indigenous people in different in the different you know hats I've worn in the world. Um, I'm yet to find one Indigenous person that tells me this makes me feel so much better. Yes. And this yep. really helps. Um, you know, and Australia has, definitely has a checkered past, whether it's Stolen Generation, whether it's, um, you know, Mabo, all the other things that mm. have happened in our, just in our time, right? Um, I don't think we, the way we do, uh, come up with a strategy to assist works. Yes. Because we just overcompensate and worry mm -hmm. so much about how it looks on the outside and Everyone uses it as a platform to get voted in. 100%. I look at it from my time in child protection. My time has just been an outsider walking into these homes. Yeah. And I've walked into some absolute squalid mess. Yeah. You know, these... And, and look, I understand there's a lot of nuances and a lot of factors that have brought that, that into that home. And that's, that's a slightly different conversation. But, you know, the funny thing for me is because exactly like you say, we don't want to take Aboriginal children out of those environments. We don't have the support networks of the same culture um, to facilitate that. We wouldn't leave, I would not leave a kid from another culture in that space. Yeah. I would pull them out and I would talk to docs, uh, you know, facts, whatever you want, making these mandatory things and go back and the kid's still there and no one's changed anything because... We don't want to have that perception, but we're creating a, you know, this cyclical effect where, you know, parent has an issue, um, then that gets passed on to the children, and then those children have children, that gets passed on. We're not making anything better. I mean, one of my big things when I look at that, the community and the struggles they face and their over-representation in the prison population, when I think about it, I'm like, the studies are quite clear in that what, and, and if you do jump, say, to the states, it, it's a lot more obvious in when they've done the long-term studies, what creates delinquency and long-term offending behaviour? And it's all those same issues that we see in lower socioeconomic communities, yep. right? Uh, low education, um, no access to good housing, um, elements of addiction, um, violent communities, um, you know, parents either no parental supervision or parents working long hours not being able to be there. Um, you know, that whole just domestic violence in the home, um, that escapism that kids try to do because they can't or don't want to be home because there's molestation at home, DV, whatever. Yes, yes. Um, I just, and a lack of role models 
in their close family or in their community um, that they can easily access and, the, and extracurricular activities and education, you know. And this is what takes me back to the point of if we, if the community, if the government organisations were able to work together to help children before they got on that path, we could break the cycle. Yeah. But then child breaks or, or individual, no matter who they are, breaks the law. And at some point in time, the, the question is, when do they have to, when do they pay the price that everybody else has to pay? Um, when, when we join the police force, there's a, you take an oath of office or an affirmation and it says that you uphold the law without fear or favour. And I took that quite seriously. And for me that, I don't care about your race, your creed, your background. If you've done the wrong thing, then my job is to put you before the courts. And if you're Aboriginal and you've done the wrong thing, then I've got to put you before the courts. If you're white and you've done the wrong thing, I've got to put you before the courts and follow the processes and procedures that are in place. But what are the things that, you know, many of the ATSI community don't have access to is all those things that create delinquency um, in that community. And police are being asked to manage that at the end of the spectrum, which is causing these people to end up in a prison population when really the intervention should have been well before police even turned up. Yeah, and we've looked at, and this is again, it's, it's, it's endemic of, of the way we respond to things in this day and age. There, there's what happens in the literature, in, in studies and in ac academia, um, there's the anecdotal evidence on, on the ground from the mm -hmm. frontliners and, and, and what they do. Um, but then there's all this overlying political rhetoric oh, um, yeah. that always seems to inform policy. Yeah. Right, and th that's that becomes a real issue, and it just depends who's in the chair at the time mm -hmm. on what the strategy is going to be. In in looking at, um, you know, especially work in the other home care that I did with with people flock from Indigenous, I remember that when we did um, if, actually if going back to my days in DV, so I was leading a, a team, uh, a domestic violence response team, that was half child protection workers and half police. And everything would be a certain way unless you had an, an Indigenous child. Mm -hmm. And I remember I'd had two jobs almost back-to-back, -back, identical, mm. right? One of them was a, a non-Indigenous kid. It was a... It was a I don't, I'm not sure if the, the child was... Yeah, I can't remember the background, but definitely non-Indigenous. And the, we, t we removed the child due to sexual assault from one of the parents, mm. right? Um, Nobody in the wider family, uh, as in wider, not wider, not the wider family, um, was appropriate. Most, most of their family um, were, not, um, were not in Australia. So the ones that were here weren't mm. great people, mm. right? Um, and so the child was removed and given to the out-of-home care pathway and to the foster care yeah. service. The second job I had where it was an Indigenous child, again sexually assaulted by the parent, um, I went to do the same thing and I got, no, you can't. And I'm like, well, I'm looking at the three possible options for this child. Mm. One extremely violent, one in jail, one another um, has sexual offences. Where do you want me to put this kid? Yeah. And that's very frustrating because, you know, I've said this uh, in, in other, other platforms, I believe the police should also do uh, the Hippocratic Oath. Mm. You know, like mm. the doctors do swear, no more harm. Right? Yeah. I'm not going to take this child out of this harm and put him into this harm. No. And so, what do you do? And this is now, and this is the police flexing its muscle with child protection to try to f do the right thing. Mm. You know, and that's that becomes a huge issue. But you're right; it's not be the the police in New South Wales aren't geared to be social workers. Yeah. They don't have the training. They don't have the expertise, and it's not what they signed up for. Mm -hmm. mm. Right. So. The on-the-job training they do, because I used to be part of the ones that deliver that, right, in terms of DV, gives you an awareness and understanding of what there's that there's, hey, there's complexities in life. Yeah. But it doesn't mean you've got the chance to sit for three hours with a victim of DV and explain the cycle of violence, the honeymoon phase, what's going to happen here, what he's going to do. You have to very give the express version of what that is because your job is to deal with the offender. That's right. 
right? Yeah. And you're not looking at the generational psychological effects of the kids and their trauma because your job is in front of you. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to do. The other services have to plug in to do that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I feel like with the indigenous population, it should be, again, same thing. There should be all these other intervention strategies happening there. Yeah. But the problem is the government solution is throw money at it. That's right. Right? If you're indigenous and you want to open up a business, you get this grant. If you're indigenous, and you're, you will give you this grant. How does that help the kid who's two years old being sexually assaulted mm. by the auntie mm. in a home where it's communal and everybody's there? Yeah. That, that doesn't help anything. You know, there needs to be something happening at a much deeper grassroots level. And, and look, I think that that's community informed yes. is really yeah. important. But that is my thing when I look at a lot of the different government programs. I'm like, how does it help the kid? Yeah. How does it help the little one that's going to be perpetuated in this cycle of violence or victimisation? Um, and, you know, the, the thing is, it's really... You know, the other thing that comes to me for, for this community with law enforcement is... We spoke in the last episode about perceptions and the, exactly the same thing, so much so with this community, and that is you're only doing this because I'm Aboriginal. Yeah. You know what? I'll, all right. Let me, uh, let me delve slightly off the topic because I've had this as an example many times before. You're driving down the road at night, you know, um, whatever local area command you're at, p- police area command, driving, you know, you would mark police car, get overtaken by a vehicle at speed, you turn the lights and sirens on to get to pull over, it doesn't pull over, you do a rego check, it's stolen, pursuit's on. 3am in the morning. Let me ask you a question for, I know you know the answer, anybody out there, when you drive at night, can you tell the skin colour of the person that's driving that vehicle in front of you? Because I know for 18 years I couldn't. I'm not chasing the vehicle because it's being driven by a member of um, a culturally and linguist- linguistically diverse community or um, from an indigenous population. I'm chasing the vehicle because it's stolen, because it's you know, a danger to other people, because it's likely been involved in other serious offences. I'm not going after it for the person that's driving because of who they are. Now, that person crashes and the car is a write-off um, and the driver driver's deceased. Is that my fault because I tried to do the job as a police officer. Well, there's a whole bunch of protocols we can go, we'll go into pursuits one day, it's a really good topic. Safe driver policy. But to understand all the things that go into that. But at the end of the day, you didn't choose to be the one that stole the car, you weren't choosing to drive at speed, you didn't do all that. You open the door, try to pull the driver out, and it turns out to be someone from from a, you know, something other than a white person. Do you try not to save them? No. You still try and drag them out. You still try and do first aid. You still try and do all those things. Yet if that person is from an um, Indigenous community, as a police officer, you're automatically thinking Aboriginal death in custody because that is a death in custody because you were chasing them yeah. even though you had no idea what their, their background was. Now, don't get me wrong, I know that we've seen all those other terrible and heinous kind of offences um, and they are offences by police and people in positions of power against members of the Indigenous community, but there's a great proportion of cops out there that they didn't set out to, for that action to happen. They're just doing their job of pursuit and trying to catch people that are breaking the law. Um, yet they know they're going to be crucified for that. And it had nothing to do with the person that was driving the car other than the actions of the person that were driving the car. Yeah. And so then when I take that a step back and I, many of my interactions with the community were coloured not by my own beliefs because, like I said, in my original, in the last episode, I was saying I worked out very quickly that it didn't matter who you were and where you were from. You, it was the individual I held responsible for things, not the community they came from. And yet you deal with members of the Aboriginal community, Indigenous population, and they were against you because you're a cop. Right? And I get that that's generational um, in some respects. And I get that's because they've had a lot of interactions and maybe mum or dad has been arrested and taken away and things like that. But there's another side to that. And that is that you're, if you treat everybody like they're coming after you, if you believe it's going to happen, 
it's going to happen. And what I mean by that is I just stop and I just had this thing, right? I would stop and talk to people. When there wasn't jobs going on, I was quite proactive. I liked to stop and talk to crooks. I liked to stop and talk to people because that's how you get to know your area. So you go and talk to someone who might be Aboriginal. And what's my purpose of talking to them? They're there, I'm there, same space, same time. Talk, communication. Yet they're like, well, I'm not doing anything. What do you want? I'm like, well, well, automatically I'm on the back foot thinking, I've got nothing, no issue with you. And then they start creating an issue. You're only doing this because I'm an Aboriginal, right? From my perspective, they're creating an issue, if that makes yeah. sense. And then I'm start becoming, I start becoming suspicious. Of why are you suspicious of me? What are you worried about? So I am start formulating, all right, well, do I have grounds to consider that there might be an offence taking place here or, or what else is going on? And then that's like, well, I just want to talk to you. F off. They say F off. And you're like, okay, well, there's, there's a summary offence. And I hang on, okay, now I've got to talk to you and warn you about your language. You can get effed, I'll eff and knock you out. Okay, well, now we've got a threat. We're in a public space. And it escalates very quickly and you've got to go, they, they won't calm down and talk to you. So you end up escalating with them and then it goes hands on. They end up in handcuffs, they're back in the truck. Yep. And I saw that happen multiple times. But you didn't get out of the car with the idea of wanting to do that. You got out of the car with, hey, just it was just, yeah. And if you went to a member of the community of a different community, you know, who was just standing there, they wouldn't have that perception. They wouldn't have that belief that you were there with grounds to, with an idea to arrest them or harass them. So the interaction would go so much differently. Yeah. But perceptions and previous representations to them of what police it are. Self-actualization. It became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Exactly right. Yeah. But, and that's the thing too, like, but also understanding that they're, they're in a situation where all the stories of the elders don't, don't help. <laughs> it's, all a, it's, a, it's all been sort of, you know, this victimization, mm-hmm. this persecution, um, all this kind of stuff. So to them, that's, that's where this road leads. And, you know, and I've been there. I've been there many times where, like, you know, same as you. I was a massive talker, as you've noticed. <laughs> so I'll, I'll have those conversations, but I, yeah, you got to pick your mark, and you're mm. like, I can see where this might go. Then what happens also is, even if you ended up say, just taking the details and not mm-hmm. pursuing anything, you're going to write a, an intelligence report about yep. what happened, right? Yeah. The next cop that does any kind of background checks on this person is going to see, oh, previous officer, bang, this person's mm-hmm. got warnings for mm-hmm. belligerence towards police, you know, yep. resisting, da da da. And once again, now that becomes yep. more grounds to take further action right. and search again and do all these kind of things. And you think to yourself as a cop, well, if only you just said hello and good morning and keep yeah. on your way. But from their perspective, it's like, I'm going to be harassed wherever I go. And every time I see a cop, I need to walk the other way. Yeah. And so they don't talk to me. Yep. You know, and, it just, it, and again, that's where your, your position of the acolytes, you know, the, you know, your yeah. original community layers and officers. But even then, they were a dis- dispersed mainly to high indigenous population areas. It wasn't like the, the Meklos, the multicultural mm. liaison officers, where they kind of went to every, every, every kind of station, around, yeah. trying to, to match the community that they're in, which you, it's never going to happen, but you try. Um, but same as you, like I didn't really, I think myself, I, how many Aklos did I meet in my 18 years? I think two, mm. right? And I did a lot of work with Meklos, a lot of work with multicultural mm. liaison officers, so I'd see them at the seminars. But in terms of coming out to do training, because historically the the stations in southwest Sydney where I worked didn't have large indigenous. Yes. They had some enclaves, but not very large populations. And then again, as cops, we're only seeing the criminal element of yeah. the indigenous community. Yeah, that's right. Do you know what I mean? There is, and I, I don't want people to think that we're not, like we don't see that, because we know there are some fabulous people in every community, Everything. but particularly in the indigenous community, some people that have, and they've been hard against it. Yeah, you know, they've they've really had a rough childhood. They've not been given anything. They've worked their butt off to get what they've got. And I, you know, just so much respect for those people. Um, but going back to something you were saying, you, that was exactly my thought process. Was I'm a channel surfer. I'll go watch, um, and I, I don't care what channel is on. If I find something that's of interest, I'll watch it. Now, when I channel surf and I go through NITV, the you know kind of um, channel that's dedicated towards the ATSI community, 
the number of TV shows I see on there that propagate this idea of police uh, against you and they're racist and, you know, you won't get a fair deal. And then those pre... And, and I think it's interesting, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting to a point here, people, uh, it's interesting that then you have those old stories of when potentially police were racist, but also those people in the community that did get wrong. How many people do we know um, that were locked up and they said, oh, no, the cops just had in for me, I was innocent, I didn't do that. Yet I know the ins and outs of that case. I've prosecuted people that still claim they were innocent. I knew that they were lying. I've had, like, listening devices where they've confessed to their mates that they did it, but they still tell everybody else that, you know, the cops railroaded them. And there's this uh, psychological concept around recency, yeah. and that is that effectively if someone says that, you know, the, for example, in this case, the police, if I say the police are racist and then in your mind you can come up with a recent thing and it could be real or it could be fictional that, that tells you that police are racist, then you will believe all police are racist. Yeah. And so what that means is, and even if that's not true, right, the point is, uh, and one of the things they used in the forensic psychology literature was breaking in as and personal safety. If you could cast your mind back to the last, like within the last few weeks that you'd heard a story, real, fictional or indifferent, or you heard a story about a friend of a friend of a friend who'd been mugged on the street, you'd believe that crime was high and that they were, you were unsafe, even though statistics proved you were probably in the safe, like in that particular area, you were safer than you'd ever been before. Yep. And so this is this concept of recency and this self-fulfilling prophecy that, hey, cops are racist and then you know, we don't talk to police and then every interaction you hear about and then it's in the media you consume and so then, of course, as soon as you're confronted by a police officer, they're racist and they're only picking on me because they're a racist cop, which is potentially completely untrue. And this is the battle, right? The, we don't have the open lines of communication. We don't talk to Aboriginal kids um, at a young age and foster that element of exchanging information. This is who we are and this is what we're doing and we're not creating that layer in policing where we encourage cops because the first time you have the interaction with the Aboriginal person that's doing nothing and you're just trying to talk to them because you want to have that level of communication and you get a negative response, what's the first thing you do as a junior constable? That all went pear-shaped, I'm not doing that again. Yep. I'll end up in a complaint, I'll have to do more work, I was just trying to do the right thing and I've screwed it, yep. right? And that Aboriginal person, when they, they have that natural level of suspicion and they speak to you poorly and then the police speak back, like, you can just see how we're all getting it wrong. Yeah, and the problem is we're for, it's hilarious because it's, bo it's, it's both ways. You're still, you're labelling someone, mm. you're, you're labelling a collective yeah. based on an interaction, you know, one interaction or one individual. And... When you sit in the police car and you're, dealing, you're with someone senior to you, uh -huh. and then they're telling you their, your views, you know, that crusty senior constable yeah. that hates everything, um, and the whole world's out to get him. And, TJF. Yeah, exactly. TJF. Yep. The job is effed. And there's, they're telling you, uh, these ones that live in this house are place, blah, blah, yep. blah. So then they're casting aspersions on all housing commission. And then there were police officers that were brought up in housing yes. commission. Right? And... And so you're like, it's so funny, like, yeah. you're doing the same thing. Mm. You're doing the same thing. So then, like, you're, you're trying. I remember when I do education to, to police officers, I'd be like, just try not to absorb that cynicism. Yeah. All right? And every time, even on the TikToks, so what's the one bit of advice you can give me? I'm just starting out. I'm joining the cops or I've been in for a month. I'm like, just don't lose your humanity. Yeah. That's, yep. that's what you got because that's what they need. The police force needs to remember it should be reflective of its own community. Because mm, mm. it's community policing. Yes. Yeah? yeah. Which means you are a representative of the community you police. Yep. So if, as long as you think everyone else is the other, mm -hmm. okay, then you will keep, you'll have a loyalty, hopefully, to yourselves, um, but then you see the community as just a burden. Yeah. As this thing you need to keep at bay, right, when that's not the whole point of policing in a society. Mm. And that's the issue. We, we can't afford to lose the humanity in the equation because there needs to be that empathy in the delivery of what you do. 
you're the same person that's going to deliver a death message to, to someone. You're the same officer. Yeah. Right? Where you're going to give the most horrific news to someone's loved one, right? Yeah. Um, you're going to give them the worst news of their life. That same human being is also needs to be able to, you know, grab a very violent offender, yeah. you know, off someone they're supposed to protect, care and protect. And also in, deal with someone who's 15 years of age, who's had a very tough life, who didn't pay a train fare because mm-hmm. they can't get a job. And then there's complexities. Yeah. You know, and... If, yeah, the, the law is black and white. Yeah. Yet there's thousands of shades of grey yeah. in between that, which they they just can't train you for. Yeah, exactly. And that's what it is. It's about being, all right, be broad. Mm. Under, you have to be very tolerant and understanding in what you're looking at. Because, and the reason is why, because, well, you're the person who's trained in this equation. You've been given allegedly enough skills yeah. and resources and tools on your belt um, to be able to handle anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? That's, that's kind of what they're telling you. And when you look at it, it's quite, it is quite ludicrous, but it is what they're telling you. Yeah. They're telling you, you sit in that car because the, car, the world doesn't see your rank. The world doesn't see how many years of experience. No. It sees a marked police car turning up to a job. You're there to get it done. Yeah. It could be your second day. It could be a, your last day in 25 years of service. Community doesn't know. They just know you've turned up. You're expected to handle this. Yeah, yeah. I think, um, look, I know there's a there's a few cops that watch and listen to us, um, and one of the things I would say that I... See, when I when I have those interactions with people, I don't care which part of the community they're from, uh, black, white, pink, purple, uh, Middle Eastern, you know, Chinese, whatever. Um, I, I kind of took that as a, geez, I screwed the pooch on that one. I've, I've got to go practice, right? So I try to go talk to more people. Um, but one of the things I found that worked really well and is a good phrase because I think it appeals to people was when someone would get uppity at me um, or, you know, start screaming at me or, like, and it was going south for no reason, I'd say, look, you show me respect, I'll show you respect. I will meet you at your level. And that point of respect catches a lot of people because... Ultimately, everybody kind of wants to be treated with respect yeah. and they, they often feel that police are disrespecting them. So when you take it back to that point of, I will meet you wherever you set the bar and I'm showing you respect. And then I'll say to them, I often, like, I would call them out and say, look, and I'd use the term brother. I'm like, my brother, am I, am I yelling at you? Then why are you yelling at me? And you, Have I sworn at you? Then why are you swearing at me? We're just in this together. Let's just talk it out. And I understand that you're having a bad day, but let's, let's go through it. And it was surprising how well that worked. And honestly, when that didn't work, it was going to go hands-on. It yeah. was kind of like that point where someone was not going to be talked around if you try that kind of approach once or twice and they just keep escalating. You, you're going to end up going hands-on. That was my experience at least. But yeah. understanding that people want to be respected. But I think that's a really good rule for police in engagement with anyone. Make sure, like you spoke about in the last episode, that police officer that came to your window showed you no respect. He didn't take you, take account of the fact that he didn't know you were a cop, but he didn't take account of the fact that you're just Joe Citizen. Show respect. Yeah. And then meet them at that level of respect. And usually, uh, you know, they say don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Well, when you're dealing with respect, when they're showing less respect, show a little bit more. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, and that's what I, I think is one of the best ways to... You can't change everybody's opinion, but you can change one person's interaction with the community, and that's how we change. In law enforcement, that's how you change community sentiment. Yeah. It's interesting, like, you, when I look at the... In my time, what happened for me was the, there was a couple of innovations in, in, our, tool, in our tool kit, right? Um, Taser? I trained, I trained on the revolver, Right? Yeah. And then got issued the Glock. Right? So we moved, we, we enhanced our, our firearm. Um, Not the shooting skills. Shooting skills sucked for most people. Yep. And then, then they gave us OC spray. OC spray came into the equation, I think, in, my, in, the, in the next year. And there was a couple of versions. So I had the original version. I remember mm-hmm. it very well. And it had an expiry um, sticker down the bottom. Yes. I can't yep. remember how many years this was, but it also has your manufacture date. Yeah, yeah. And 
on purpose, I never replaced my spray. Yep. I never used it. Mm -hmm. In my entire career, I never used my spray. It had its seal still there. Yep. And I had it, it's expired so long. And because it was the first Mark I or whatever it was of the... And I remember when I, would, I used to do induction training for the probationary constables. And I said to them, you're going to come across cops that will gloat mm -hmm. how many times they've sprayed someone, how many refills they've gotten of the OC, and then later how many times they've tased someone. Um, I prefer you be the one that gloats you never had to use it. Yeah. Because the best tool you've got is your mouth and your, it's your communication skills. Yes. And the best cops in the street were always those that could communicate. So the ones that could de-escalate. Because mm -hmm. you always had your people that they would turn a parking complaint into a oh. war zone. Right? Yeah. It was 100% going to be a brawl. You'd hear them on the radio go, oh, no. <laughs> you know, you'd, you'd get rostered. You'd look at the board and go, I'm going to punch on today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, 100%. And no chance. Some yeah. angry man or angry woman are working that shift. And no matter what it is, there's going to be spray. Right? Yeah. Then it come into a haze of OC, right? And have your history yeah. response. And you don't want to be that guy or girl. Like, no. you want to be the ones that, thank God I'm working with Anthony today. Mm. Right? I know I'm going to go home tonight. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that sh really should be the gloat. That yeah. You, you, you're able to achieve what you needed to achieve without needing to resort. And don't get me wrong, someone pulls out a knife, yeah. I'm not going to kiss him. But, <laughs> but also, how many people have you talked down? Yeah. The and and the, there's, there's such a skill in that, yeah. you know, like the, I got more pleasure out of talking someone around and yeah. skillfully negotiating with them to do something that they didn't want to do and then have them do it anyway, yeah. rather than upending someone and, you know, like that's, anybody with a, who trains can do that. That's yeah. not hard. Yeah. But talking someone around and, and you know, knowing that person well enough and using those tools, those, oh, that was, that was fun for me. Like, I really enjoyed that. Um, but I, I think what you're saying is that, you know, from that perspective, it's, it's being lost on... Uh, we're, we're not using that well enough. And as the organisation is running out of troops, people leaving in droves, that skill set... Like, you, I learnt from good operators how yes. to talk to people. Yes. Um, and I was try, always tried to be a sponge. Like, why did that guy have someone yell at him and that guy, same situation, had the guy hug him at the end, go, oh, you're, you're mad, you're the best cop I've ever met, kind of thing. Like, how do I get it was, that? It's, it's that yeah. walk-up. I remember the distinctly, um, you know, observing when I was really junior, one of the sergeants turning up to a job with his hands in his pockets. Mm. Just walked up, his hands in his pockets. And every, everyone else I had seen so far had, had taken out their baton, yeah. right, on this guy. He just walked up with his pocket and he was so casual and it just naturally made you go, sort of calm yeah. down and he just he was he spoke in this calm collected voice didn't interrupt the guy let him talk did this never spoke over him and just steered this guy this mm. guy was a very angry man um and you know you could see all the other officers just also then sort of step back and calm the situation yeah. and i was like that's leadership you yeah. know i saw them like that's what i want to be i want to yeah. be that guy right um and he's not the guy that goes back to the mushroom and high fives everyone because he, you know, was able to sweep the guy on the ground and mm, blah, blah, blah. Mm. Um, and that's that's really important. Those, those skills and they 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 translate great later in life when you when you end, end yeah. up leaving the police because you know how to talk down someone. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's a time there's a time for escalation and there's a time for de-escalation. Yeah. But yeah, the, I think the communication art is so important, and that also transcends into your issues with communities. Yeah. Because you understand, if you can be empathetic and you understand, hey, I, don't, I might not have the solutions for you, right? And that's fine. I'm not here to have your solutions for everything. But there can be an understanding of where I stand and where you stand and why you fear what you see or why you hate mm -hmm. what you see. Yeah. But let's, how do we make this work? And, and we need both sides of the equation yeah. to be working towards yeah. that, yeah. Um, as difficult as that can be with all the, the baggage that we carry. Yeah. Um, Look, I, I, I hope this has answered some of your questions and, and you know, explained how, we, how the police force do things and, and where we've seen some of the issues. Um, if you have any questions or concerns or you want to raise anything, uh, please feel free to comment on uh, which mainly Jenny is the person that sits behind the camera here, people. So, uh, Jenny, where is the best place for them to comment? Is that Instagram? Yes, Instagram would be amazing.
amazing, leave a comment or shoot us a DM and we will get back to you guys as soon as possible. I don't know if that recorded, but she said Instagram. <laughs> uh, you know, there was, a, there was a whole bunch of things like DMs and things that I don't even know. Uh, but that's okay. That's why we have a 20-something-year-old to help with our, <laughs> our um, podcast. So, yeah. All right. So that is the end of our episode. Please shoot us any questions. Uh, who are we sponsored by, Danny? IC Technology. Uh, their website is ictechnology.com.au for all things cyber and IT. And also, as always, Precision Integrity, and you can find us at privateinvestigatorsydney.com.au. Thanks for listening, guys. I hope you got something out of it, and we look forward to joining you on the next episode.